you say Ganesh. Just needed a place for my notes, such as it was. A good morning, everyone. Well, oh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Murli. I serve at the our Seattle community. So it's reflecting on today's topic, how do we face our tests? And it, it occurred to me that a far more desirable topic could have been, how do we not have any tests? <laughs> and in some ways, that's, that's a little bit of a, um, well, explicitly or implicitly, we long for that time when life is completely deterministic and we are completely up to the task of whatever is given uh, to us and uh, therefore we can cruise through eternity in complete comfort. And that is not to be, although it is to be, and I'll, I'll come to that kind of a paradox soon, but mainly the fact that we are here in this world means that everybody, all of us, will have challenges of some sort or another. And frequently, as more decades accumulate in our lives, we realize that the challenges that we have are exactly the ones that we never wanted. They always say there is this one thing, if that doesn't happen to me, then I'll be good. All the others I'm mentally prepared to face, but there is this one thing. And the more clarity we have on whatever that one thing is, the more it's actually a revelation saying, well, that is the one thing that we probably should face. Uh, I have taught yoga, the Hatha Yoga asanas, for may maybe 20, 25 years now. And one thing I've always found, and what we always talk about as yoga practitioners is, if there is a yoga pose that's hard for you, that you really, really don't want to do, that's the one you should be doing. Because if there's a yoga pose that's easy for you, you've already learned everything you need to learn from it. There is nothing more to learn. There is no karma that comes up. There is no purification that happens. But if something that's hard for you, well, guess what? That's where God is right there waiting. Okay, come to me. Let me make you stronger. So tests come. There is a some of you were here before the service uh, started and there was one chant uh, as was sung it, pranayam be thy religion. And one of the lines in that chant is pranayam be thy uh, wish-fulfilling tree or be thy wishing tree. And there is this concept that you know, we are, God created us in his own image and therefore we too are able to be creators. The way the universe works is if we truly want something, doesn't matter the moral level of what we want. If we truly want something, the universe rearranges itself to give it to us as long as we work for it. If there is desire and willpower that focuses that aspiration that we have and we put energy behind it, it is going to come to us. This is the this is how we are created in God's image, that there is, um, and this is the essence of free will, is whatever we want, we will get. Now, this sounds like a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> now, let's turn this around and look at it from a, uh, from a past uh, perspective. Does that not mean that whatever we have is what we wanted? <laughs> no, that doesn't seem quite as desirable anymore. But this is the law of duality. See, this is because unsaid in the universe being a wish-fulfilling tree, we get whatever we want. There are two important corollaries to that particular thought. The first one is whatever we want are we capable of handling it when we get it? Now, what do I mean? Well, if we wanted it, I mean, if I want good food, of course I should be hungry to eat it. That's not the level at which I'm speaking of. But uh, let, me, um, let me give you a different example. There is a, there's a wonderful story in the Mahabharata. Mahabharata, as you all know, is a great 
Indian epic. And what's interesting about the Mahabharata is, it is not so, you know, all epics eventually have a common pattern among them, and that is, there are good guys, there are bad guys, and eventually, good guys kill the bad guys, and everybody lives happily ever after. In Mahabharata, that's not the case. Everybody is kind of good, everybody is kind of bad, everybody is flawed, and depending on the choices they make, they individually either grow or fall. And therefore, it's more raw, it's more reflective of our life's condition. Now, the hero of the Mahabharata, if there is one, is a man named Arjuna. And he, uh, he's, he has many characteristics, but what's pertinent to us is that he's a great warrior. And he has the ambition from day one to not just be a great warrior, but the greatest warrior of his times. This is what he wanted. Now, of course, the universe gave it to him. But it wasn't that simple. What it meant to be a great warrior back then, this was in the Dwapara Yuga, the descending Dwapara Yuga. During that time, people had the power to harness the potential of the mind to change the nature to their will. So they were able to think with deep, concentrated thought and with their energy, modify the universe so that in front of us a column of fire would spontaneously manifest, or a great gush of water would manifest, or mountains would be um, uh, would would fly from wherever they were and fall on you. You know, these were weapons of mass destruction, except not in a way that you would think. So these were called astral weapons, and that's what Arjuna wanted. His teacher was a man named Drona, who knew all of this, and he kept asking Drona. I said, sir, when are you going to teach me this? And Drona kept saying, well, you're not trying hard enough. You're not ready for it. You're not trying hard enough. And then this kept on going for many, many months. And Arjuna, who was a very determined, enthusiastic, fiery kind of student, he was a front bencher, always kind of listening to what the teacher was saying. He was that kind of a guy. So eventually he said, sir, you just keep telling me that I'm not trying hard enough. What should I do? He says, well, can you shoot arrows when, you're, uh, when you cannot see? Of course not. How can I do that? Well, you're not trying hard enough. So then one day, they always ate at the end of the day, right around 6 p.m. When it was outside, it was dark. And uh, so there were lamps lit. And one day, the, there was a gust of wind. They were eating. There was a gust of wind, and the lamp blew off. And it was complete darkness. And... Arjuna didn't pause eating. I mean, just think about it. You're eating and the electricity goes off. I don't know about you, but I don't pause eating because my hand knows exactly where my mouth is and my hand knows where the food is. So why should a little bit of electricity bother come in the way of this thing? So you just keep eating. And that's what Arjuna did. And then he paused. And he said, I cannot see anything yet. I know how to eat. Why is that? And he kept thinking. I said, well... Perhaps it's got something to do with practice. So at midnight, there was always a bothersome owl outside of this ashram where they were learning. And the owl used to hoot uh, right around midnight, waking everybody to say eerie sound and it was bothering everybody. So Arjuna said, well, I cannot see the owl, but let me practice. So at midnight, he got up, Drona, the teacher, was sleeping on the bed. All the rest would sleep on the floor. He got up silently, tiptoed, and touched the feet of Drona. Uh, to seek his blessing, uh, and then he went out and he began to shoot arrows at where he thought the owl was. It was pitch darkness, he couldn't see anything, and the owl was way far away. And then nothing happened, the owl continued to hoot, and Drona, who wasn't really asleep, smiled to himself. And then Arjuna came back 3 a.m., next day classes started at 6, uh, 5 a.m., and then as continued, he tried it again the following day, touched Drona's feet, Drona smiled, he went out, the owl continued to hoot, and then he came back again. And after about a week or 10 days, whatever, Arjuna finally was able to hone his senses with such great precision that one day he touched Drona's feet one night, he went out into the pitch darkness, the owl was hooting, and then suddenly it stopped hooting. And then Drona smiled. Finally, Arjuna is now able 
to shoot arrows only by sound and not by sight, and so great is his concentration. He is now able to harness the full power of his mind and unleash on his enemies the weapons of mass destruction. And so therefore, next day he called Arjuna and said, my son, I'm ready to teach you what you wanted. This is the way the universe works, is when we want something, we should be ready to handle it. And therefore, we are called to be stronger. We are called to be more determined. We are called to be more focused. And whatever other attributes it requires for us to have what we want. So sit back and examine perhaps your own aspirations. Uh, not just now, but even from before. And perhaps say, is the test I am facing because I need to be stronger to have what I want. One of Master's disciples, Dr. Lewis, he was always pestering Master to have an experience of God. And, one, and then one day, he, Master Paramhansa Yogananda, as uh, teachings we follow here, and we often refer to him as mas Master. So one day, Master, uh, Dr. Lewis asked him again, and Master went up to him, held him by his collar, kept his face close to him and said, if I showed it to you, can you handle it? If I gave it to you, can you handle it? See, that is, we ask something of the universe. We are made in the image of God. And many of the tests we get are to make us stronger. So there is, those of us, those of you, all of us, that are on the spiritual path, that at some level, have realized that the outside world is always going to disappoint us and we need to reach for something much higher. We've asked God of what is essentially the ultimate gift. It goes beyond astral weapons. Uh, the, the superpowers we are asking for is as super as a power can get. And therefore, it, it's like one of those coasting bicycles, I think they are called, when you pedal forward, you move forward, and when you pedal backward, you break, and then you start moving backward. And that's the relentlessness of the spiritual path, is every action we take either takes us towards God or takes us away from God. There is really no other choice. You see, that's why the seeming ruthlessness of life's tests is because we need to have a sense of sternness in our consciousness to say, no matter what, I am going to pedal forward. I am going to seek God. And when we make that commitment, like Arjuna was, he, he, God says, well, you're not ready yet here. Let me, let me hold you up. I'll give you this little thing to do. And then if you did it, then I can give you something more. So there was once, uh, Swami Kriyananda uh, writes in his book, The Path, I think, or maybe it's in one of his talks. He said that he was going through a very hard time in his life. And he wrote to Ananda Moima, the uh, famous uh, self-realized woman saint of Bengal. And Ananda Moima wrote back very simply. He said, the difficulty you're facing, accept it as a blessing from your guru, not even as a test, but as a blessing. And Swamiji writes that it didn't seem to him at all that it was a blessing at the time. And he said it was years later, years later, that he realized that whatever he was facing was the greatest blessing he could have had at the time because the nature of spiritual tests is that they will make us stronger or we learn something from them. But in either case, whatever the reason it is, or it could be karmic, who knows? It, like I said, if universe gives us everything we've asked for, then whatever we have is something that we asked for or the duel of it or the result or the opposite of what we asked for because that's the nature 
of uh, the outward aspirations is they all come with it with its own dual. So some of the tests might be karmic, but it really doesn't matter why they come to us. The more we look at them, whatever is in front of us to say that, ah, this is the greatest blessing that I can have at this point. Now this is nice to hear, but it's really very hard or, yeah, you know, all of you must be a little suspicious of what I'm saying. I myself feel a little suspicion in me as I offer this silver bullet kind of thing. So obviously it's very, very hard to sit back and look at your tests and say, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for making me go through all of this crap. Uh, <laughs> eventually we'll get there. It is, it is possible. Um, but it's, it's very hard. But here's a practical reason to, to look at things that way. Many, many years ago, uh, I, have, I have a master's in computer science. And at the time, I was an academic. Uh, you know what? You know the term ivory tower academic? That they sit someplace and think grand thoughts, and along with thinking those grand thoughts, they think they are a little bit better than the rest of us. I was like that. Mm. And... I picked a very obscure field of computer science just because I could go and tell people that this is what I wrote my thesis on. It was called computational complexity theory. Does that sound good? <laughs> and so, so I had all of this self-identification of who I was that I wanted to sit, have a piece of paper and pencil in a closed room and think grand thoughts and therefore have everybody say how great I was. This is... This is as frank as I can be with you. This is how it was for me. So I graduated computer, uh, this, uh, my uh, master's, and I was, I was fully confident that I'll get a job that is going to allow me to think grand thoughts. And for various reasons, uh, God had other plans. And the job I got was that of a support engineer uh, where somebody would have very pedestrian problems and then they would call you and you'd pick up the phone and say, this was, I used to work for Microsoft, and I'd say, how can I help you? And then they'd say, well, my computer is not booting up. And then you say, have you plugged your computer in? Can you check that? And, oh, I see. Or it was, there was nothing grand or thoughtful about the whole thing. But that's the job I got. And it was very, very unhappy. Uh, to say the least, uh, really unhappy with this outcome. Uh, because for one, it required me to speak to other people. And in my own image of people that have grand thoughts, they really shouldn't speak to other people. Uh, <laughs> but then, and, and I, I resisted this for three full years, but... Uh, one of the blessings of being an immigrant is that whatever job that you take first, you're more or less stuck with it for the next X number of years because that's how long it takes for you to get a green card. So God had painted me into a neat little corner where I was not allowed to have grand thoughts, instead was forced to speak uh, to people. Back in those days, it took about four years to get your green card. So that's how long it, I was stuck in that job. And then once I got my green card, I said, okay, now I'm going to go change something else. I took another job, but the first thing they said, I wouldn't answer the phone, but they said, you have to go speak at conferences. So I found myself speaking to a large number of people. This was the worst outcome as far as I was concerned because I, I really was very, very, very nervous at public speaking. I really was. Um, but then many years later, I realized that whatever it is that I need to work out, is my tendency is to stay up here and think grand thoughts but not relevant thoughts or practical thoughts. You can think beautiful thoughts but they, does, they don't amount to a hill of beans as far as handling life is concerned. This is just whatever my karma is, that's how I came into this lifetime. And therefore, the guidance for me was to say, well, you need to share the teachings in a way that's 
practical and relevant for others, in doing so, it's going to become relevant for me. You see, the key to my growth was to do it that way. And for that, I had to give up the self-identification of being this ivory tower scientist and do something that I truly didn't want to do. And the fruits of it became obvious a full decade later. But that's the nature of our tests as well is, if you ask for the ultimate price, then you should make the ultimate sacrifice, so to speak. I don't mean it in grim terms. There is a lot of joy in this one. Um, but the ultimate sacrifice is to let go of precious self-identifications. And that's a lot of the spiritual path has to do with the fact that we let go of these self-identifications. And that's another reason acceptance is so important. When tests come to us, the immediate, uh, the, the immediate thing is, well, how can I make this go away so that things can go back to how it has always been? Things can go back to how I wanted it to be. That's our visceral reaction to any test. And instead, what is being asked on the spiritual path is, calm acceptance. It, uh, in the Festival of Light, you'll hear uh, Riman and I read this. Today, it says, the new dispensation for us, it's no longer suffering and sorrow when we are faced with tests, but calm acceptance and joy. So the importance of looking at tests as a blessing lies in the fact that if we allow that thought, we are open to the possibility of what might happen. Because tests are not meant to be overcome, but transcended. See, transcendence is the name of the game. It's, if it's overcoming, then you can keep tinkering with it. You can acquire more skills, you can acquire more this and that, and eventually have the opposite of uh, that happen. That's what a test is, something I don't want is happening. I want to make the opposite happen. But the whole idea is to not be dependent on it. It's, uh, what Swami Kriyananda says is, oppose with deliberate contentment the heart's natural uh, desire to reach outward for its fulfillment. So nature of many tests, and the reason they are, is to open us up to this possibility. So the, 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 the third aspect, one is, of course, that tests are there to make us stronger. The second is that tests are there to by eliminating a self-identity, we become bigger. You see, there is one less thing that limits me. Uh, so I can continue to have great big grand thoughts now if I wanted to, but I can also come and speak in front of people just to uh, close that loop for you. But tests always have the element of transcendence in them. That's the second reason. Now there is a third, it's not so much a reason, but a third trick to deal with tests. So the same Arjuna uh, that we encountered, he later on goes to fight a great big battle. And he has all the reasons to fight it, but the misfortune was the people that he needs to kill in order to win are his relatives, people that he was very close to. His heart was very vested and filled with love for them. And so he says, I'm not going to do this. What kind of battle is this, he says. Uh, this is not why I trained for. This is not the battle I wanted. I wanted guts and glory, but not at the expense of killing all of these people. And then Krishna, who was an avatar, and who, he was Arjuna's friend, and for reasons that will take too long for me to explain, he happened to be, at this point, his charioteer. So when Arjuna said that I don't want to fight this battle, this greatest warrior of the age on the eve of battle, there are seven battalions depending on him. And he says, no, nope, don't want to do it. I have second thoughts. I don't, the whole thing's not worth it. And then Krishna tells him an interesting thing. And this is from the Bhagavad Gita, the conversation between Arjuna and Krishna. On the eve of battle is the scripture that we know as the Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna tells him something interesting. I'm going to say that in Sanskrit first. Uh, the nature of these Indian scriptures are such that they've really not 
deteriorated over time. There have been no changes that have been made to it. So what I'm about to tell you is almost certainly the exact same words that Krishna used to Arjuna. So he says, Yadruchaya chaupapannam swargadwara mapahvrutam sukhinah kshatriyah partha labhante yuddhamidrusham. They spoke in Sanskrit apparently. And so what it says is, you are so lucky that without you asking, this particular battle has dropped onto your lap. Blessed is that warrior who fights this kind of a battle. So he's saying that you didn't ask for it. It just came to you. You were not the creator. And see, God gave this battle to you because this is what's exactly needed. Don't ask why this is so. Why is this happening to me? What are the consequences of facing this test? Because they all limit you. So he says, blessed are you that you have this battle in front of you. And he says, Sukhe dukhe same kritva labha labhau, labha labhau, jaya jayau, tatho yudhaya yudhyasva naivam papa mavapsyasi. He says, in this battle that you are about to fight, Arjuna, he says, there will be wins, there will be losses, you will feel good and you will feel bad. Then he says, same krutva, sama means, to, sama means uh, equanimity, it's a word from which samadhi comes from. He says, make those the same. Either in other words, when fighting the battle of life, when facing your tests, maintain equanimity. So it's not acceptance, grudging acceptance, okay, indignant acceptance, angry acceptance, but it's equanimity, calm acceptance. So he says, accept it calmly, and then fight the battle of life. And he says, naivam papa mavapsyasi, meaning you will not incur any sin. And that what that translates to, to our way of understanding is that there will be no karma that accrues when you fight the battle of life that has come as a genuine test to make us stronger. If we go head on and fight that, try to transcend it, then done in a calm fashion, there is no karmic rebound, you see. This, this is why on the spiritual path, it's not enough to simply fight the battle of life. It is just as important to be calm about it. And again, I, I, I say this with the full awareness that I have raised the bar even more. At first I said, well, take it as a blessing, and second, be calm about it. But let me try and give you the rationale for it. The, there is... Um, Swami writes in one of his um, books that God gives the answers according to the strength of our desire to find him. That when we face the tests, kind of in a restless, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, and kind of nag our efforts to see, okay, I've been doing this for two days, why hasn't it happened? And, you know, that kind of a thing. Then uh, what we do is we stand, we become a block for ourselves. There is um, William the Conqueror who had a divinely guided mission to uh, occupy England. When he comes across uh, the, the little narrow channel uh, from, I guess, Normandy is where he came from, uh, into the shores of England, uh, he jumps out and stumbles and falls on, uh, onto the dirt, which in the Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition of the time, this was a very bad ill omen, it was a very bad start to the battle. And then what William the Conqueror does is, uh, he, he looks up and then uh, he just jumps up immediately and then he takes the dirt in his hand and he says, I have seized this land and, and in this moment it's mine. And then uh, and people, the army suddenly cheers because their bhav has been changed around it, their viewpoint has been changed. And on that same day, in a very historic battle called as the Battle of Hastings, he makes great progress. Where I'm going with this is, how often it is that we start something really, really big 
And on that day, something unexpected, something bad really happens, and then we go back and say, not today. This is not right. Let me, let me get over this particular little crisis I'm facing, and then let me come back and restart. So this is one of the reasons to say, well, whatever's happening, let me be calm about it, but really not let go. That inner, um, uh, inner spiritual sternness is very, very important. And my final point on this, and I'll end my talk with this, is God nev never turns his back on a devotee who keeps trying. So what's required is, here's the thing about tests that we face in life, and that is almost always we are bound to fail, at least in the beginning. That's, that's, otherwise, why would it be a test? Right? It would just be a quiz. Or it's an open book quiz. It wouldn't be a test anymore. Uh, we are almost always bound to fail because mm, in his book, Once and Future Christ, which uh, that, uh, in Freeman's book, Once and Future Christ, he writes uh, that the, the power of Satan, meaning the, that outward force in the universe that is working very hard to make sure that we don't go towards God. That is stronger than willpower. The magnetism of Satan is stronger than the magnetism generated by our willpower. So we are bound to fail. Uh, but it's important to get up and keep trying, not because somehow our willpower will become greater and then we have the ability to overcome this satanic pull. Willpower will become greater, but the name of the game is grace of God. You see, that's it, when you set this big goal of divine joy, of transcending life suffering, then what gets us out is divine grace. And the reason to keep trying is, as much as the magnetism of Satan is greater, greater still is the magnetism of God. And it's our effort that's going to attune us into that magnetism. So it's like, um, uh, you know why airplanes have engines? Not so much because they need to fly. They do a little bit, but airplanes have engines so that they can take off. That's, that's, where, uh, that's where the power of the engine is required. Airplanes fly because the unseen air lifts them up. But the engines just need to go fast enough so that there is enough air on the top of the wing than on the bottom of the wing so that it lifts them up. And our facing tests is more or less like that. The engine of our willpower needs to work hard enough and consistently enough, not in a stop-start way, that eventually we are lifted up above the test by this unseen grace of God. And for us as meditators, a great place to stay, to stay tuned to this grace is that period after all of your techniques. When we sit there with our uplifted gaze, tuned to God, or if uh, those of you that know what the OM technique is, or those of you that um, have, um, uh, have some kind of a training in listening to the sound of OM, or staying in that sound of home. And if you don't have the training, it's basically going inward and staying in tune with this inner peace, inner calmness, the uplifting inner sound that comes. The more we stay there, the more we get the power to be lifted from our tests. And that's the key to facing a test is you don't so much face it that you wait to be lifted from it which requires facing it. So it's, it's a little bit of a pivot of why we do this. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Amen. I must.
stranger, poor youth that I am. What destiny bears me hence to that shore? The chalice of life, scarce sipped at the brim, has slipped from my grasp and stains the dark floor. Has life any meaning, the grail that men seek has never been found on earth? The fountain of youth, oh, only a myth, none who ever roamed far in search of it ever found what he sought. Yet see how the night sky which banishes the sun is banished in time by the dawn. Death comes like a gypsy who camps on the way. At dawn his dark caravans gone. To death I'm a stranger, yet strangest of all. The stranger I feared is a stranger no the shadow I feared but hides from the sun. In death there is peace on God's infinite shore. Yet see how the night sky which banishes the sun is banished in time by the dawn. Death comes like a gypsy who camps on the way. At dawn his From Napoli, la 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 la. Life is long and joy is free, la 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 la. La 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 When you come to Napoli la 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 sing this happy song with me la 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 When you come to Napoli la 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 sing this happy song with me la 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 